message to tell you about Al-Biruni's measurement of the size of the Earth, which he performed around 1025 as a publication of this work. And uh, it, it is part of our series on the role of geographical determinism in history of trigonometry. And in fact, Al-Biruni himself um, includes some remarks uh, pertaining to this subject. And so first he discusses how you might determine the size of the Earth in a manner similar to that which we have seen before, the Eratosthenes fashion, which is, uh, involves uh, walking with camels a massive distance within uh, within Egypt, is part of the determination, or the Chinese one that we saw, you know, also based on the same principle, traveling a long distance in Earth. So al is aware of those kinds of methods. I mean, he does not mention those people specifically, but he is uh, notes that it's possible to determine the size of the Earth in that way. However, he says, such a method requires strong command over a vast tract of land and extreme caution is needed from the dangerous treacheries of those that spread over it. And instead, he says, here is another method for, determin uh, for the determination of the circumference of the earth and it does not require walking in deserts. So th that is to say, Eratosthenes and the, Gre and the uh, Chinese measurements, they had at their disposal uh, vast... Uh, lands that were quite realistic to travel those kinds of distances and make perform the necessary distance measurements. Uh, Biruni found himself in a different situation. For him, it was not so easy to travel because he lives in these desert areas, and uh, you know there were there were tribal f uh, or warfare going on and all these kinds of things. So it's not so easy to to travel to those requisite distances for making these kinds of trigonometrical measurements. So instead, he cooked up this other method. The them prompted by the geographical circumstances and here is his method so we have here the earth and now uh, I have uh, shown here a mountain uh, standing on the earth so a somewhat exaggerated mountain but you know let's have a look at that what we can do with that so uh, we can determine the height of the mountain that is a straightforward trigonometrical uh, exercise that you find in many textbooks uh, these days so let's say I know the height of the mountain and I want to know, obviously, the radius of the Earth, or the circumference of the Earth, and the same thing, you know. So, uh, you know one, you know the other. In order to do that, I'm going to consider this a red line of sight, which is the line of sight from the peak of the mountain to the horizon, which is also, another way of putting that is, it's a tangent line to the circle, because when you look toward the horizon, your line of sight is just touching the, uh, the edge of the you know, the circumference of the globe, really. Yeah, so that is a uh, tangent line to the circle. And then I can measure this uh, green angle over here for uh, the, the, the how far, uh, you know, up I have to turn my eyes before I hit the horizon, so to speak. So, so you know, if, you, if the Earth was flat, it would be 90 degrees, but since the Earth is around, you have to look a little down from the 90 degree angle before you hit the, the horizon. It's going to be a little bit lower than 90, maybe 85, 88, you know, something. So that's some. Um, uh, those are the measurements that are necessary to do this because you then have a right angle triangle situation. Because this red line is a tangent line, it touches the circumference of the Earth. Uh, in tangential fashion, which means that the radial line, which I drawn dashed here, meets it at a 90 degree angle. It's perpendicular. The tangent line is perpendicular to the radius in a circle. So, therefore, I have a right angle triangle, in fact, and I know that I already measured that one of those angles. So, you see, I end up in this situation here, where I know the height of the mountain. I'm looking for capital R here, and I know the theta, the angle. So, with a simple trigonometrical uh, calculation I can determine the radius of the earth r from this equation so you notice that I didn't have to travel anywhere to perform this I just need to know the height of the mountain and the angle of sight from the tip of the mountain to the uh, horizon so and, and this particular angle you measure it in, in this kind of fashion you know you have this quadrant uh, it's like a protractor type of thing with all the degrees marked on it and then you have this plumb line which is just a ball of lead on a piece of string which will determine uh, that part, the, the ball of lead is going to point straight to the center of the Earth. So you automatically have that line for reference, and then the, uh, the second edge here, you point toward the, the horizon. And then that's how you have, so now you have those two directions, and you can measure the angle between them. So that's straightforward enough.
uh, here is where the uh, the measurements took place uh, I have marked it on this map here uh, in present-day uh, Pakistan near near Indian border so these mountains uh, this is uh, is a, a, a region which is ideally suited for this kind of proof because the geographical circumstances are ideal because you have here an, uh, an area of land which is very flat that's the the, the Indian continent and bordering on uh, uh, extremely massive uh, mountain range so you have enormous mountains uh, racing very s dramatically straight s from a very flat area of land which is exactly what you need for this proof to work because you need a high mountain and clear view of the horizon so you can't have a bunch of hills around it because then you can't see the horizon so you have to have a clear view of the horizon and that's exactly what you see just as the height uh, it's color coded by height obviously so you can see that the green uh, or light yellow is basically flat so this whole if you're looking south from from that position you are looking at all out over basically a flat stretch of land whereas the mountains themselves are very high in that area so and here I have a picture from that area of what it looks like it probably this mountain here or uh, it could be this very peak that he used uh, Biruni or possibly one next to it but we know with some precision that it must have been in this area so he's quite precise he describes certain uh, features certain military fortresses and things that we can pinpoint it with with accuracy and as you can see we have high mountains a clear view of the horizon very flat land below it which is exactly what is needed for the purposes of this demonstration so I mean to so to determine the height of the mountain itself obviously it's a standard uh, exercise in trigonometry textbooks and here I I have a situation where we're determining the height of this church tower or, or building of some sort uh, that um, uh, is easily done in this instance by forming this right uh, triangle over here with the distance to the to the building we can just measure it however what is likely to happen with for example with a mountain is that we cannot actually walk all the way up to the to the uh, the foot of the something analogous to the foot of the building because a mountain you can't stand at the point on the ground beneath the peak of the mountain because the mountain is massive you know you can't walk to that point and then you have to use the method which is uh, described here that you measure the angles at different uh, places without actually walking all the way up to the foot of it just like uh, there's another illustration of this principle that I want to know the height of this tower however you see that there's this wall in the way I can't actually approach it therefore you see these guys have figured out how a trick they measure the angle here in these two positions and the distance between those two positions and then they can determine the height of the tower without actually being able to approach the tower as such so you get basically when when you set this thing up you know you have one equate one trigonometric equation for for the first of these measurements and another trigonometric equation for the second of these measurements and there are going to be two unknowns involved in this system of equation namely the height of the tower which you want to know and also the length of this stretch the uh, the wall there which you don't know it's an unknown in this calculation but uh, or so but nevertheless since you have two equations you can eliminate that one unknown ending up with an equation for the the only the one unknown that you're interested in the height so then you can determine that so that is indeed what uh, um, the method used by Al Biruni he also describes precisely how he did this and he used exactly this method uh, taking two measurements like this and measuring the distance between them because measuring the height of a mountain is very much analogous to this obviously because it's like a wall so to speak that you cannot approach the uh, the mountain uh, it's not it's not just a, a tower because it has also obstacles in you know, uh, to for for approaching it so uh, that is the method and that is also the reason I would say why it's even better to have a flat stretch of land ahead of you than the ocean you might say what if I take a high uh, mountain peak by the ocean that would be pretty good because then I have a very clear view of the horizon because the, the ocean is completely flat so it's perfect for that yeah it's kind of good but it makes it harder though to tell the height of the mountain because 
what if you, uh, you need to do this measurement you need to measure the distance between these two places and these angles how are you going to do that if this is all water it's going to be very difficult to measure this distance and even the angle while you're in a in a little boat on with with waves and everything so it's much better to have a flat piece of land actually so indeed the circumstances were very perfect where bruni found himself and he carried out his calculations so it's very much uh, again the geographical circumstances were ideal for these for this purpose and here i have shown what he also mentions as an important uh reason for carrying out this investigation for measuring the earth so bruni himself uh, says right here that an important uh reason of uh, motivation for measuring the earth here is to uh, because it's important in the determination of the direction of prayer in of of muslims you know in in islamic faith you have to pray in the direction of the kaaba in in mecca here like this uh, uh, all of these people are praying in the direction of the Kaaba. You can see this is called the Qibla, then the direction of prayer. So in order to determine that, you, if you are far away from Mecca, if you're in a different country altogether, if you're in Pakistan somewhere and so on, you have to uh, perform rather sophisticated calculations to determine what exactly is the direction to Mecca. So that will be, uh, uh, you know, knowing the, the size of the earth is going to be an ingredient in being able to perform those kinds of calculations. So that's part of, again, the cultural factor that influences uh, this, uh, f uh, influences the, the nature of his trigonometrical investigation, whereas certain other cultures were more interested in measuring distance to the sun or something, because it's kind of cool to know the heavens. So uh, in this case, uh, cultural factors uh, steered his attention more toward the Earth itself. And uh, so here I have a photo from uh, hotel room when I, which I stayed in in Iran and so they have you, the, the Qibla is marked it is painted into the, uh, the the furniture there so you can always know the direction of prayer just to show the centrality of that in uh, this culture and here uh, I'll show another photo from my trip to Iran which is this uh, statue here depicting Al Biruni measuring the earth this is, this is a, uh, a statue in Tehran Okay, thank you.